Okay, it's now time to sum up what I've been observing and to reflect on what is gained and lost in Tom Wright's far-reaching and insightful account of the Jesus of history. First, the gains. As Jesus and the victory of God rolls on and the evidence accumulates page after page, we find that Tom has achieved some extraordinarily impressive results. His construction of Jesus is wide-ranging, eloquent, and cohesive. From a theological point of view, here are the major gains that I see. Number one, reading in historical context and depth. Tom narrates a Jesus who for the most part fits intelligibly into the history of Israel in the first century under Roman rule. Jesus' identity is thoroughly Jewish. Number two, recovery of the political and pragmatic character of the gospel. The Jesus who steps, the Jesus who steps out of the pages of Tom's book is not an otherworldly apolitical figure. He fits within a vivid political landscape of pragmatic collaborators, resistance fighters, would-be messiahs, and others struggling to sort out the national identity of a people trodden down by pagan powers, but always dreaming that God would set them free and bring justice. Against this backdrop, Jesus' prophetic proclamation of the kingdom of God recovers its properly explosive political meaning. So Tom's work goes a long way to overcome the misguided modernist dichotomy between theology and politics. Third, the positive coherence of the synoptic storyline with the Old Testament and Israel. Tom's work goes a long way toward resolving the perennial problem of the relation between Old and New Testaments. The synoptic gospels on Tom's reading narrate a linear continuation of the storyline of Israel's national struggle and hopes. Tom's account deepens our understanding of the way in which the death and resurrection of Jesus is not simply a matter of saving individuals from their personal guilt. Instead, it is the culmination of God's astonishing cosmic plan to restore his covenant people and to bring salvation to the whole world. And that helps to bring the two testaments into a much deeper theological unity. Fourth, high Christology. Perhaps the most surprising theological outcome of Tom's historical construction is the way in which while working on what we might call a Christology from below, a Christology on the plane of historical events, it unexpectedly opens the door to the development of an exceedingly high Christology. Here is the now famous concluding passage of Tom's account of Jesus' beliefs about himself and his mission. Quote, I propose as a matter of history, as a matter of history, that Jesus of Nazareth was conscious of a vocation, a vocation given him by the one he knew as father, to enact in himself what in Israel's scriptures God, God had promised to accomplish all by himself. He, that is Jesus, would be the pillar of cloud and fire for the people of the new exodus. He would embody in himself the returning and redeeming action of the covenant God." End quote. If that is what Jesus thought about his own identity, the subsequent development of the church's worship of him becomes much more readily intelligible. Fifth, and finally on the gain side, from a theological point of view, one might hope, and I think Tom does hope, that his historical account of Jesus might have apologetic value and impact. He seeks to give us a historical narrative that takes in all the evidence and shows that the Gospels actually do give us a persuasive, coherent picture of what really happened in the life of Jesus. History, wie es eigentlich gewesen ist. To the extent that Tom's construction works as secular history, it creates a bridge for dialogue with non-believers about Jesus. They can be invited to cross the bridge, to come and see 
who Jesus was without first having to surrender completely their own historical consciousness and worldview. I fear that this apologetic hope is illusory or at least exaggerated. But it may be the case that Tom's book really does serve a slightly different sort of apologetic function, as indeed so much apologetics does. It's not a sign for non-believers, but for believers. It may allow uncertain believers to gain greater confidence about the historical credibility of a story that they already haltingly believe on other grounds. 